In this episode, there might be a few minor audio problems, um, but the show's for free, you pays your money, you takes your chances. Hello and welcome to Awesome Astronomy Episode 93 Part 2, The Space Exploration Show for March 2020. SpaceX is gearing up to launch a human crew to the International Space Station next month and Elon Musk fanboys are declaring all-out keyboard warrior-style war on anyone who dares to suggest this isn't the most monumental achievement in human history since, well, since ever. Nothing compares, obviously. I'm not getting on the wrong side of those bloviated incels. While further north, <laughs> Boeing goes from crisis to crisis, 737s are kamikaze in out of the sky, space launch system core stages are now up to double the initial stated cost, Emitting key testing on critical software in their already overpriced Starliner capsule, it must make them wake up and decide to step on a plug or a Lego brick just to distract them from the pain of work and taunting memes. Probably mostly from all those incel Musk fanboys. Anywho, (laughs) failures or festivities, we're here to cover it all with insightful commentary and opinion. Don't laugh, we try our best. My name's Ralph, your host for this month, and joining me to kick Boeing up the arse is Jen. Whopper! And tweeting that Elon Musk isn't all that before logging off and hiding under the duvet is Paul. <laughs> um, yeah, um, of course. Yeah, you know what? That that leads straight into the little discussion point I was going to have. Actually. Yeah, it does. Do we hate SpaceX? Okay, tell me about this one. That's, well, that's a new addition to the script. It, it's, it's come up a couple of times on Twitter recently with people. Accusing, oh, we literally we. Yeah, accusing us, as in like, awesome, <laughs> of. Of hating SpaceX and hating. How ridiculous is that? I, I know. Mean, how how biased must you be in your opinion to think we're hating SpaceX? We love what they're doing. We, we literally, there was a German guy um, who uh, tweeted us on and off. No. He blocked us eventually, but I just pointed out, I was like, no, look, we actually had an entire episode where we had a massive love in for Elon Musk. Yeah. We practically gave the guy a head. <laughs> I mean, literally, you listen to that episode. Literally, I, mean, I thought you said practically. Literally, literally. I don't remember that. Like, no, you, you listen to that episode, and we are, we're like, we are fawning all over SpaceX. Yeah. No, of course, of course, we love what it's SpaceX just, we, are doing. We highlight their issues when there are issues, and we celebrate the successes when there are successes. Exactly, yeah. and this, this is what some people just don't seem to get. And then we we had someone else kind of banging on about like oh you 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 go too far and it's it's almost like cult like that you how much you hate SpaceX like no we don't we don't like Starlink and but that's a tiny part of what but, SpaceX but that's does one, it, it's like you know there, there are lots of organisations and we give NASA lots of stick we give Boeing plenty of stick we give. Yeah. We give every agency. We're, we're equal opportunity bastards. Yeah, I would say that we actually probably come over more favourable to SpaceX than anyone else on this show. Mm. And probably because at the moment, SpaceX are doing fantastic things. Yeah. Of course, if a rocket goes bang, then, you know, we're going we're gonna to laugh at that. Of course we are. As long as there's no people on it. But And actually, they, they took exception tax. I said that. I said, look, come on, you know. The, the, actually, what it is, it's about what we're really poking a fun at a lot of the time is is the fanboys. Yes, is the fanboys because they're, they're hilarious. They are just hilarious. Yeah. And as I said, they you know they just write the comedy for us. And they yeah. took that's where we got blocked. We got blocked on on Twitter by this guy. That's because uh, they're a fanboy. Because I said you know look you know this is this is just they're, they're too funny not to to kind of poke fun at. It's just hilarious. What SpaceX do is amazing. Most of it, it's incredible. Yeah. There are things. Yeah things to criticize but you know that's the same with everybody but god they're sensitive about it all it's yeah. hilarious so i just know no we don't hate spacex at all but i think it's brilliant hmm. we do hate yep. starlink though yeah, but, yeah exactly but starlink is you know it's like that's only because we're amateur astronomers and we want exactly. the views yeah. of the night sky if we weren't wouldn't give hmm. a toss about starlink yeah no exactly exactly no it's hilarious i just it was it came up a few times in the last few months and i just thought i'd put it in there Okay, well, let's move on to the emails because there's quite a few of these, um, but it's mostly po- poking fun at Paul. But poking fun <laughs> at Paul, poking fun at Paul. Um, so the first one is from our good friend John Fraser, who starts with "Hello, no fawn in there." That's not a good start. I hope this solution will bring an equitable peace in the endless debate about when the new decade starts. Yes, it's that again, and it will soon be over. In fact, this is the last time we will talk about it. This show, <laughs> can this. 
it. Yes, it's true to say that there was not year zero. This is because the current system of numbering years started in 525 AD in Europe, and the idea of zero as a concept didn't arrive in Europe for another 500 years. No one alive in the year 1 AD or CE knew it was that year, and the year was back calculated by some monk in the aforementioned year probably his late night project when he was supposed to be doing something useful as wikipedia was unavailable at the time he made several <laughs> mistakes working things out and the year we call 1 ad or ce is probably not the year of jesus's birth the year he was aiming for in fact the correct year i.e the correct year one is probably somewhere between 6 bc and 7 ad 6 bce to 7 ce if you prefer as the date was back calculated wrong and not even recognised at the time, I suggest we make one more minor change to the Gregorian calendar and abolish the year 1 BC, replacing it with the year 0. The calendar would now go 2 BC, 0 AD, 1 AD. No less arbitrary than lacking a year 0, and the decade defiantly would have started last month. If it makes it more acceptable, I suggest we call this the Jenny calendar. Seconded. Which, of course, will make it more acceptable to Jen. Note, if you still wish to be pedantic and insist the new decade won't start until next January, Paul, pedantic, how dare you? I should point out that the start of the year didn't move to the 1st of January until 1752. Before that, the year started on the 1st of March, so not only would you have to wait until the end of February next year to celebrate the new decade, we're currently still in 2019, and that drunken party you went to in December was a waste of time. Well, I'm going to push my glasses up my nose and say, well, <laughs> well, actually, actually, um, actually, that's not true. That last bit's a myth. Um, oh. You're confusing the calendar year with what's known as the legal year, which um, are two entirely different things. Um, the calendar year in terms of the sort of modern era, which includes 1752, has always been the 1st of January. Um, and you know the Tudors and the medieval era they, they would have celebrated the 1st of January as the first of the calendar year we then have a thing called the legal year um, in Britain it now starts in October uh, the legal year but back then um, the legal year isn't that just the academic year uh, no yeah of course <laughs> it, no that's a different thing and it is related but um, you have four Four terms in the legal year, Michaelmas term, Hillary term, Easter term and Trinity term. Um, you may have heard these terms before. And um, of course, um, the, it originally it started on the 1st of March with the financial year, which is a different thing, but related, started on the 6th of April. Um, um, but it all moved. It did move later on and it now starts in October, the legal year. It still does in the UK. Um, and the financial year, of course, still starts at the beginning of April, which is why we will have to do our tax returns by the end of January. But the calendar year has always, even under the Julius calendar, started on the 1st of January. And that is why I did a history degree. Just for that so moment. Shame on you, John, for thinking that Paul was going to get pedantic about this. Yeah. So, um, moving on, our good friend Jackson Smitherson, who we spoke about in the last show, or we read out an email from him in the last show, also chipped in on this debate with... As for the decadal mini-debate regarding whether or not 2020 is part of this decade or the next, some clarification. Paul and Ralph were both right and both wrong. 2020 is in fact the final year of this, the second decade of the 21st century. However, given that it's 2020, it is the first year of the 20s. You know, because it's got a number 20 in it. Also, the year 2000 was the final year of the 20th century, while simultaneously being the first year of the 2000s. Additional fun fact, 2000 was a leap year. Most take this for granted, but century-marking years are only leap years every 400 years as part of the calendar correction necessitated mm. by tidal forces from the moon affecting the Earth's orbit. Mm. I like that. That's, that's a good pedantic fact. And I, like, like that one? I like that one because it is true and it is correct. I also like the wrong and right thing, because, of course, this is a piss take. So, yeah, it is right. Yeah, yeah completely. Yeah. yeah. And finally, on the topic of the new decade, no more, please. We'll yeah, draw a no. line under it after this show. Uh, we're going to kick the arse out of it now, and this will be the end of it. Our good friend Stephen in Perth, Australia, has the final word. Apologies to Paul, but a decade is simply a period of 10 years. Any period of 10 years. If I want to, I can start a new decade from the time of my morning dump, but I refer to you to more dignified references such as the Decadal Survey, also known as 
Visions and Voyages for Planetary Science in the Decade 2013 to 2022. Paul, you are correct that there is no year zero and we have not yet entered the 203rd decade of the current era. However, in your pedantic anger, I like Stephen, you may have failed to notice that no one at the New Year's party was screaming happy 203rds. You may, however, begrudgingly have accepted wishes for the 2020s, assuming you weren't repeating 1999 and sitting in a corner, grumbling about year zero, while others at the party were rubbing each other up with their champagne dripping. Oh, my crikey, I can't read that. (laughs) Uh, We've entered a decade that we call the 2020s. The old decade, the 2010s, is over. You are correct that if we project this back to the first decade, we find it only has nine years. But if we project right back to the dawn of time, we find a singularity, another anomaly we have to live with. (laughs) I'm afraid at present, no one gives a crap about your 203rd debate, but I'm hopeful (laughs) we can get everyone on the same page soon if we all agree to peg year zero to today when I took my morning dump. (laughs) Well, actually, you're going to have to take that up with the um, ISO 8601, <laughs> um, which defines, as the International Standards Organization, defines the decade as a timescale unit of 10 calendar years, beginning with a year whose number is divisible without remainder by 10. Oh, really? Ooh. Oh, wait, so the decade does start this year? Correct. No, wait, what did you say? <laughs> I got yeah, it has to start with the year. That yeah, no, it ends as it year. as it happens, ISO the ISO says that the uh, decade starts with the zero. That and was that's the, the international standards. That's the international standards. So they know their shiv. So this has been pointless. Yeah, completely. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, completely. <laughs> but it has been hilarious, and that is how good comedy and entertainment is written. Yes, and nobody got angry despite having different views on it. Exactly, exactly. No one, you're shouting at tea, Sue. You're shouting at tea. How much of my life have I wasted listening to you lot witter yeah. on? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so's John. Uh, by you lot, you mean Paul. Very much. News time! Okay, from Mars return missions to NASA looking for more astronauts to go to the moon and Mars by way of an ESA mission to the sun, somewhere in between. Paul, come sit and share some news. Uh, Okay, so first up from me is the very exciting news from SpaceX and NASA. We have a a go for commercial crew launch. How dare you say nasty things about SpaceX, Paul? I know, here's me being really (laughs) evil and I hate it, no, no. All the this waiting. is so exciting. This is what it's all been about. All the waiting, all the pain, oh! all the explosions. And here we are, finally <laughs> at the true dawn of renewed crew launch from US soil. In a final twist, this looks like it won't just be a short demo flight with astronauts Bob Benken and Doug Hurley doing a quick high and bye to the ISS. That was the original plan. But mm. they're going to do perhaps a long duration yes. mission in order to help maintain crew numbers on the station. Yes, that noise you heard was the simultaneous sound of Boeing collectively spitting their coffee across the room and Elon Musk ejaculating into a roadster. <laughs> I, I, want to, I want one of those roadsters, but not that one. <laughs> not, not unless he's had it balloted. Um, so our intrepid crew um, have been stepping up training and this suddenly included, in an in a interesting tweet that NASA put out, um, some training in the neutral buoyancy spacewalk mm. um, kind of area and some robotic arm training, which all points to Demo 2 being a mission measured in months, not days. Yeah. Does oh that mean God. then, was that, was that in the neutral buoyancy, was that using the SpaceX spacesuit? No, because that's just a pressure suit for inside the no. This oh, is, right. Okay. Yeah. 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 So as it stands, the crew will be down to three from April on the ISS. Um, and long term, this does create some issues. So stepping this up to create uh, a crew of five makes sense. It's also a measure of the confidence in the Dragon capsule. Hear us hating on SpaceX. Yeah. Um, the yeah. confidence in the Dragon capsule and a big thumbs down for Boeing because part of the decision will be based on the lack of Starliner availability in the future with no sign of when Boeing's capsule will be ready for further testing. Some sources indicating the depth of problems they have might require a further uncrewed test flight, for which Boeing has already set aside $410 million in what is probably admission that, that this will have to happen. 
So when you consider that Boeing, many years ago, demanded all the commercial crew cash and scoffed at little old SpaceX getting a slice of the pie, when you consider Boeing received more money in the end, you will forgive the girls and boys of SpaceX if they looked chuffed as fuck over the next few months. <laughs> uh, no decision has been made on the duration uh, as a record, but launch is set for the 2nd to the 7th of May. History people, SpaceX are making it this spring. God, listen to you wow. hating on SpaceX. Listen to me hating on SpaceX there. Did you get all the hate I said there? Yeah. So, sticking with the International Space Station then. Sticking with the ISS crew, I wanted to flag up the return of Christina Cook to Earth after setting the women's space duration record at 328 days. Mm. Woohoo! Yeah, this is a record that's changed hands a lot recently. It was until 2017 Europe's Samantha Cristoforetti at 199 days, which was then beaten by Peggy Whitson at 289 days, which is a hell of a jump. Uh, and now Cook takes further this takes um, further past the 300 mark and makes her the fifth longest space flight thus far of any gender um the record of course being uh valerie polyakov at 437 days the man who left the soviet union and returned to a different country oh yeah of course yeah yes he did yeah um so oh. cook completed 5248 orbits covered 223 wow. million kilometers and made six spacewalks including the first all-women EVAs, uh, three of them, wow. in fact. Uh, Whitson still has a beat on spacewalk time, though, with 60 versus 42 hours. Uh, very cool achievement, and with... Excellent achievement. And, yeah. excellent achievement. and at last, increasing numbers of women in the space programme, we are going to see more of this, especially with Artemis. So, yes, we are. News. So, uh, last for me, in perhaps the most dull space story in history, they bake some biscuits on the ISS... They came out Jesus okay. Wept. They're putting the first one in the Smithsonian. Jesus God. wept. We've literally been to the moon, flown a probe past Pluto and landed rovers on Mars, but one of the most newsworthy items in space news this month is biscuits. It's Christ on a bike. <laughs> I know. I wouldn't even mind that much, but they were those crappy cookie things that are more like a cake, really. Oh, uh, no, I do like a cookie. Oh, Soft were they Jaffa cakes? No, look, when they've knocked up a decent bourbon or a custard cream, even a good chocolate digestive, then I'll get more excited. <laughs> right. Oh, do you know what I like? I like BNBNs. The which do one? Do you remember BNBNs? Oh, yeah, they're good. Exactly. They're good. Cookies. BNBNs are good. Cookies are the children's version of what biscuits can be. Oh, right. My, my, my six-year-old makes them, and from the state of the kitchen, he may as well have been doing it in zero G. Anyway, <laughs> coming soon to the Smithsonian, a biscuit. Well, there's one to get excited about. Yeah, <laughs> take us away from the depths of misery and biscuitry. All right, well, I have a very exciting announcement from JAXA, which is the uh, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, and they've officially green-lighted a new sample return mission, right? Yep, yep, to bring yep, back go on, piece, say it. To bring back a piece of Phobos, Yes. Oh, the oh, oh. Yes, oh. that is a very exciting oh i know it's very very cool <laughs> so the plan is they're going to launch in 2024 then they'll get to mars in 2025 the mission is going to go to phobos and demos but it's going to touch down on phobos for a couple of hours grab some samples and then head back to earth to arrive in 2029 oh that's so how exciting. shit hot is that where is a tesla roadster when you need to ejaculate into something <laughs> Oh. <laughs> uh, I think it's just I think it's just missed you guys. <laughs> that is so exciting. Oh, I know, right? So the the kind of I mean, apart from it being like mind-bogglingly exciting, um, the whole idea behind the mission is uh, it'll help us understand the Martian system, um, in particular the origins of Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars, because uh, this is actually really hotly debated. Um, some people say that they captured asteroids. And then some people say that they're actually recaptured bits of Mars that were flung off after an impact. So if the first option is right, the returned material will tell us more about the early solar system. But then if the second option is right, then the material is going to tell us all about the composition of early Mars and even help us unravel how it was formed. Mm -hmm. So whatever the solution is, it's going to tell us something really, really cool about Mars. Yeah. Um, and... 
as if that wasn't enough, right? A visit to the moons of Mars is actually going to allow us to bring back more than just material from the moons themselves because over billions of years the moons should have accumulated material that's been like thrown up from the surface of mars because of impacts and that means that we're going to be able to bring back actual bits of mars not just bits of moon and we're going to be able to study mars in like a whole new light oh and, like, man that's exciting oh. and you I know have... what else because of what? the competitive nature of nasa this means that if JAXA are planning on doing this and getting Martian return samples by 2029, America will have to, for its own national pride, they will have to accelerate that part of um, Mars 2020 that is storing a um, a container, a sample of Martian dust or regolith or, uh, mm. or rocks to bring back to Earth. So they've not actually got the return part of that mission yet. It's just the the 2020 rover is going to create this sample and leave it in situ for a future craft to go and recover it. Yeah, That's going to accelerate oh, that. America will yeah. want to do that before 2029 if this looks like going ahead. Hey, yeah. by the way, I don't want you to get blue balls, mate. Yeah. But the Roadster yeah. is 94,177,703 miles from Mars at the moment. Is that right? Yeah. So, hold on. Yeah. Hold on. With some with some cold sublimating jizz in the passenger seat. Yeah. Yeah. Think Margaret Thatcher. Just just keep it, <laughs> but not the Gillian Anderson version. <laughs> I saw her in a petrol station. Did um, you last month? Yeah. Gillian Anderson, not Margaret Thatcher. That would have been bad. <laughs> that would have been freaky. God, Thatcher's in a petrol. What? She she played a great Miss Havisham. Again, Gillian Anderson, not Margaret Thatcher. Did she just? Mm. That yeah. was a great adaptation to Vanna. Yeah. Anyway, we died. Anyway, on. back it's not just astronomy on this show, folks. <laughs> Jen, back to you. Well, I'll keep the celebrations going, right? But this time the celebrations are not for Ralph and they're not for JAXA, but they are for ESA. This is because of their very successful launch and deployment of their new solar orbiter, yeah. which has successfully returned its first data. So, yeah, exactly. It's a great milestone. And they were a little bit concerned about whether everything was going to kind of deploy okay or not. It was built in Stevenage, so no one's more surprised than me. (laughs) Just some bloke in his shed going, oh, yeah, that'll do. Yeah, we've not had the issues over imperial and uh, metric measurements yet. That's coming. (laughs) Well, for now, let's just talk about the solar orbiter uh, a little bit. Um, the craft, it's got 10 instruments on board, um, and they're designed to make measurements of the solar wind, the magnetic field of the sun, um, the magnetic field in the space around the craft, uh, take images of the sun, uh, all different wavelengths, do a bunch of different things. And the, the kind of worry over this craft was that a lot of these instruments are out on this giant boom arm. Um, to keep it away from any electromagnetic disturbances that might come from the craft itself. Uh, and so they were really worried that this wasn't going to deploy, but it did. Yeah. Well, hey, so it's good. Um, the data being taken now is just kind of calibration stuff, and science data is going to start being taken in May. And uh, to quote Daniel Muller, which I have to quote him, he's one of the project scientists, and this is what he had to say. We have just started the rehearsal and one by one additional instruments will join. Once we're complete, in a few months' time, we will be listening to the symphony of the sun. Oh, man. How beautiful is that? There's a man who wants to get a quote in the papers. Where's that roadster again? (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to finish up before you guys do on a quick update about China's hopes for a new space station. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so uh, in April, a test version of China's new six cruise spaceship is going to be launched. Oh. And that is all in preparation for the construction of their new space station, which they're hoping to have finished in 2022. It's going to have about a third of the space of the ISS, um, and it's going to employ new water recycling technology, which means the water is no longer going to have to be shipped up to the space station from the Earth, which is what they had to do on their old space stations. So that's a great advancement for them. Um, The water vapour from the astronaut's breath and their urine is going to be fully recycled into clean drinking water. 
Yeah. Lovely. And there's plans for there to be space for up to a dozen experiments on board this space station. And there are even talks of having a telescope that kind of orbits along with the station, alongside it. Oh. Yeah, a little optical telescope. Yeah. But I think that's just kind of still in the planning stage at the minute. But yeah, so I, I guess this is just kind of one that we'll, we'll revisit over the next few months. So yeah, mm. watch that space. Impressive. So, for the big news story up for discussion this month, we're going to talk about NASA's 2021 financial year budget, which sounds dull as shit, but actually it lays the foundations for their Moon to Mars program. So, NASA are asking for a whopping $25 billion next year, which, despite the fact that they're looking to go back to the Moon and Mars, still only puts NASA back to their early 1990s funding levels and around half the inflation-adjusted funding levels of the height of Apollo. So, mm. what is all this money going to be spent? spent on so exciting well i've had to look at this and nearly half of those funds are going towards getting people to the moon and then mars yes so 12 well, billion mm. now there is a big caveat to this entire discussion that this is what the president's put forward and it's all yeah. got to be approved by congress yeah but we're not going to discuss that we're just going to pretend that all of this is happening yeah and go from there the thing that concerned me was that there was this little sentence of um the budget is redirecting funds from lower priority programs to fulfill the president's promise to get americans back to the moon um and so i was like oh no oh no but why what what's being cut Uh, i will come to that at the end i guess uh but let's talk about the happy things now about going back to the moon and going to mars and stuff like that so uh, the, the the first thing in terms of um, Artemis itself that this kind of it's almost ironic in a way that this is to accelerate getting people to the moon by 2024. Uh, the first thing to say is that it actually um, builds in a delay for uncrewed test flights back to 2021 mm. uh, from 2020 was going to be the first uncrewed test flight. So yeah. the first crewed test flight is scheduled to be in 2022, but which still keeps them on track for the first uh, return landing in 2024 with people on board. I mean, um, I'll be surprised because I feel like when they were saying, oh, you know, uncrews test flight in 2020, we were all a bit, oh, that's very soon. Well, I think I think it's it's a recognition of one some of the issues that a certain company that's quite key to building the sls <laughs> having the big rocket yeah yeah the big rocket um so i think i think building in a little bit i mean it, it's not pushing it back far we were only looking at the end of 2020 anyway so this isn't a yeah. huge sort of delay um and actually probably just taking some of the immediate pressure off of this probably helps guarantee success yeah yeah i would have thought yeah so um, I guess we're not too worried about that. No. But what it what it also does is plows a lot of money into the actual lander, of which there are mm. three companies now that are bidding in to provide the lander. Um, and that's the the main component. I mean, of course, there is the um, the kind of lunar gateway, the, uh, the the space station around the moon that's going to be created as part of these plans. Um, and uh, those two key pieces of architecture, the lander and the orbiter, are both funded as part of this, or, or funding towards them uh, from mm. part of this budget plan. But of course, um, that means that um, science section of NASA uh, loses getting on for a billion dollars uh, yeah. as part of this. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, isn't so it? robotic exploration of Mars is still supported in the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, and the Mars sample section of that that I mentioned earlier is still due to be funded as part of this, um, and the Mars Ice Mapper mission to help find landing sites as well. Uh, the Dart mission keeps its funding, and so does Psyche. Uh, what what are, what are Dart and Psyche? Uh, double asteroid redirection test. It's a planned space probe that will demonstrate the kinetic effects of crashing and impact a spacecraft into an asteroid moon for planetary Ooh. defense purposes. Oh, excellent! And Psyche. It's a planned orbiter mission that will explore the origin of planetary cores by studying the metallic asteroid 16 Psyche. Lovely. And there's going to be more money for Dragonfly, which is the, I believe that's the helicopter on Mars. Um, oh, it's not, no, it's not just a helicopter. It's basically a drone. Yeah, yeah. On 
No, um, Dragonfly is not for... It's for Titan, isn't it? What? It's Titan? Isn't it? Oh, man. Oh, oh more money Hang for on. that. Yes, please. Dragonfly. <laughs> yeah, that's going to Titan. Yeah. Yeah, Dragonfly oh, is... Sorry, you made me doubt myself then. I wrote an article about this, but when you were like very confident, like, oh, that's for Mars, I was like, <laughs> is it though? <laughs> <laughs> you made me doubt myself. Yeah, no, Dragonfly is the, um, the well, quadrocopter that's heading to Titan. Um, it, it's so exciting. You know, it, it's a mission that it's literally going to fly about over the surface of Titan flying you know like hundreds of meters every day yeah. so it's going to be able to really explore the surface so much more than um a rover ever has and yeah they're going to have this sorry i love this mission i'm, I'm going to a little bit of a fangirl thing a minute but um they have cameras on they're gonna have cameras on board dragonfly where they're gonna get you know essentially you know accounting for light speed time uh travel needed uh, they're going to get live views of Titan and they're going to put like operators basically in a room with like loads of screens, like VR sort of thing, where they can be flying over Titan with the probe uh -huh. so then that they can see the data in real time and they can look at the terrain and they can work out where good landing spots are and what should Ooh. be avoided. And oh my God, it's like the coolest mission ever. That's so exciting. But unfortunately, what this means is that there's less funding for the Euro uh, Jupiter Europa or Europa Clipper. So the the details on that aren't um, fully formed yet, but there may be a cut in that. Hopefully it won't mean won't jeopardise the mission. And there's also less funding for the Earth science missions, but we're not sure whether this is because they're actually being put on the back burner or because uh, they're getting closer to launch, so they need less money. But there are some projects that are going to be cut. Uh, Sophia, which is the 747 with a back part of it cut out so that you can stick a telescope through there, um, that's being cut. But uh, it's not surprising because Sophia had just become a PR exercise. It wasn't delivering as much science as, as they'd hoped. And NASA was oh, really... Oh, it's so do... cool, though. It is cool, but it's just not delivering enough science. And it's really yeah, expensive it's cool, to run. Though. So I'm not surprised that's going. Uh, but the office, this will upset you, Paul, the Office of STEM Engagement is going. Uh, so that's more on the education side. That's ridiculous. Uh, that, that one that one does make me cross because... Yeah. yeah. It's so important. It, that's the future. Yeah. But but I guess what they're thinking is that people are going to get so excited by Artemis yeah, that that will but... do a lot more than the STEM Engagement Office could. Yeah, but it, it, in some respects, it, it, it's not much money. Yeah for that and that's that's just there's 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 another i feel like there's another there's another side to that decision <laughs> um and i'll leave it there yeah let's not go down the politics line mm. and w first w first wtf uh yeah what the fuck like i just <laughs> no so um W first is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope, um, which is is going to kind of operate in the near infrared, and it's going to have a much wider field of view than than Hubble ever had. Um, basically, whereas to put this in perspective, whereas Hubble needs hundreds of pointings in order to study like the Andromeda Galaxy, W first has the field of view to do it in two images that's how much faster it is and this telescope was supposed to be critical for finding exoplanets for doing galactic um, astronomy for doing extra galactic astronomy like discovering loads of stuff about galaxies like it was going to be a really really diverse instrument and now the president is recommending that it gets cut and i am very angry it's an anger regen because yeah. i am an infrared astronomer and there's i mean there's not a lot yeah going on in with with the infrared world and especially with JWST we still don't know what's going on with that and many is being directed from W first into JWST like many other missions have have felt this pinch i am not happy about this one no nope, clearly not and also we um there's going to be two um earth observation missions that mm. are going to be called as part of this so pace and clario pathfinder missions they're they're going to go as well i mean and all of these could be over uh, overturned by congress but that's the way things stand and that's because of the relentless march to get onto the moon and then to mars the clario again there's another there's another side to that one but we won't go into it here climate absolute radiance and 
refractive observatory. It's all about observing climate change. Um, oh, that's something mm-hmm. shocked me recently. That, we'll leave it uh, there. Jim Bridenstine, who's been incredibly Im- mm. impressing us all since we were quite uh, unhappy about his, him being installed as the NASA administrator, is now a believer in human effects of climate change uh, or human effects affecting climate change um, just because, you know, the preponderance of data that the agency that he runs um, shows him. But, um, yeah. yeah, that mission is going to go anyway. But, um, mm. but Jim Bridenstine, good guy now. He's in our good books. Not just because of the earth science stuff, uh, and the um, and 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 climate, but the the way that he has run NASA and the way that he is um, accelerating the uh, the Artemis program, uh, just just hats off to him. Especially when you've got the stuff that's going on with Boeing too. And now we turn our attention back to the world of light that we can't see. Remember radio waves that provide FM radio or Wi-Fi to your phone is just a light at wavelengths that our eyes can't detect. So this show, we're going to look at the people and developments that opened up the world of radio waves to us. Jen. So because this is an astronomy show, I'm not going to talk about the origins of radio communication because, to be honest, I think we could do a whole other show about that. Um... But yeah, here at The Good Ship Awesome, we're going to talk about the radio astronomy side of things. So in episode 92, we talked about the discovery of radio waves themselves. Uh, But now we're going to address a slightly different question, which is when did radio astronomy begin? So like most new fields in astronomy, it actually began quite accidentally in the early 1930s, an American radio engineer by the name of Carl Jansky was working for Bell, yeah, that Bell, telephone laboratories, and his task was to investigate some short wavelength interference that was messing up radio communications. Basically, long distance telephone calls were really crackly and Jansky was assigned the task of figuring out, well, why? So to do this, he built an antenna and he used it to scan the horizon in all directions. Interestingly enough, the wheels upon which the antenna rotated were from a Model T Ford. Nice little factoid there for you. So his investigations revealed that a lot of the crackling was due to thunderstorms, but he also noted a faint repeating background hiss. Now, because this reputation was on a roughly 24-hour cycle, he originally thought that this was coming from the sun. But careful repeat measurements actually revealed that the period was 23 hours and 56 minutes, which is one sidereal day. This meant that the source was something fixed on the background sky, so it was something really far away. And by examining maps of the night sky, Jansky eventually came to the conclusion that the origin of this radio emission was coming from the direction of the constellation of Sagittarius, And so, radio astronomy was born. We now know that what Jansky had detected was radio emission from the supermassive black hole at the centre of our galaxy. And actually, really disappointingly, this was the only work that Jansky ever performed in the field of astronomy because he couldn't get funding from Bell Labs to continue his work on this sort of stuff. Uh, But the unit of radio flux, the Jansky, is actually named in his honour, so... That's a nice little accolade for him. So, despite this amazing discovery that we suddenly got this, like, very new light that was only discovered, you know, at the end of the 19th century, coming from space, um, radio astronomy really was the playground of amateur astronomers for the rest of the decade and a significant chunk of the next one. So, another radio engineer called Grote Reber, inspired by Jansky's work, built his own single-dish dedicated radio telescope in his back garden in 1937. And with it, he detected radio emission from the Sun and from the constellation of Cassiopeia, which we now know to originate from the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A, which we talked about in the last episode. He also made the first maps of the night sky at radio wavelengths, and he showed that there was loads of radio emission coming from the plane of our galaxy. And in fact, it was his work on the emission from our galaxy that inspired Jan Oort of Leiden University that was under Nazi occupation during World War II to realise that a spectral line in the radio part of the spectrum coming from gas particles could help us understand 
the gas that was up in space. And so a student, Hendrik van der Hulst, realised that there should be such a line in atomic hydrogen, that 21 centimetre line that we discussed in the previous show. And this was used in the 1950s to map the shape of the Milky Way for the very first time. So it may not come as a surprise to many of you that World War II was actually pretty key to the development of radio astronomy. So in February of 1942, a radar station in England received a really strong signal, exceptionally strong. And there was like this massive flurry of activity to try and work out its source. And it turns out that it wasn't the enemy, but it was the sun. And during the war, many researchers worked on developing radio and radar techniques. They were kind of roped into doing it. And then once the war ended, many wanted to kind of continue their research in this field, only, you know, with less dubious motivations. And universities welcomed this development and many of them built their own radio telescopes. And so by the 1960s, radio astronomy was truly underway as an important branch of astrophysics. And I'm going to skip over an important discovery in the 1960s made by a couple of workers at Bell Labs, because we're going to do that in the next episode, which is going to be about microwaves, because it's got a little bit of overlap with radio waves. But instead, we're going to turn our attention to 1967 with a young graduate student at Cambridge University by the name of Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And she was working with Anthony Hewish, who was hunting for quasars. But he'd kind of done all he could with the radio telescope he had, and he needed a new one built. So he set Balbanel off on the task with a few other colleagues, and they diligently strung 120 miles of wire along a thousand posts to create this new radio telescope. And after it was completed, she was assigned caretaker of the telescope and had the immense task of poring over the paper readout, which was the only record of the data from the telescope, which I think is amazing. Like they, There was a computer at Cambridge at the time, but it wasn't used for storing data. So she, she pulled over this data, metre after metre of it, and over the next six months, uh, Balbanel looked at 900 foot of paper, and she discovered around 100 quasars using this data, but also something else. It was a blip over and over, repeating in the same part of the sky, repeating every second. And nothing had ever been seen like it before until she found another, and then another, and then another. So a few months after the discoveries were published and the data was eventually recognised as the astrophysical signal of the then theoretical rapidly spinning neutron stars, or pulsars, as the term was coined. And infamously, Balbanel's supervisor and his colleague won the Nobel Prize for this discovery. And although she was snubbed by the Nobel Committee, Balbanel has gone on to rightly receive so much accolade for this discovery. She's won award after award and prize after prize, and, and quite rightly so. And really, this is how radio astronomy has continued. If there was ever a field for groundbreaking discoveries of the invisible universe, radio astronomy is where it's at. So the research that's done at radio wavelengths, it really does probe the most exotic but kind of hidden phenomenon in the universe. Today, radio astronomy is hunting signals from the most distant galaxies using arrays of dishes that span literally hundreds of metres The square kilometre array, which is due to come online soon, is going to have a collecting area of one million square metres. It's honestly, it's an engineering marvel and it's going to have a resolution exceeding that of the Hubble Space Telescope. Think about also like the Arecibo Observatory, which is a radio dish, a single radio dish that's got a diameter of 305 metres. And there's also the FAST telescope in China that's got a 500 metre diameter. Like one telescope that's 500 metres across is insane. There's workhorses like ALMA, and they're allowing us to understand the gas in galaxies in truly exquisite detail, helping us to unravel star formation, galactic rotation, black holes, all sorts. Um, It really is an amazing field and I wish that we had more time to discuss it Um, but hopefully that satisfies your thirst for knowledge on the pioneers of radio astronomy. Ta-da!
From incredible advances in radio and radio astronomy to horrible advances in science with a fantastic question from our good friend Alan Beach. Alan says, hi Martian, overlords and tape measure fiends. That's a reference to Astro Camp, if you were wondering. I've just finished reading Bernard Lovell's biography and was fascinated by his dilemma regarding developing radar for the war effort. But this eventually led to a lifetime of discovery in radio astronomy, which might not have been developed without his insights during the war years. This led me to think about great loops in astronomy that have thrived on the back of advancements that only came about due to conflict. Werner von Braun and the American rocket development springs to mind. So my question is to the Martian Welsh Collective, what do you think was the greatest astronomical or scientific advancement that came about due to a dubious past? And do you think it was worth it? Paul, do you want to kick us off with your thoughts? Okay, well, I'm going to go straight for the big one here, and one I used to teach about back when I used to be a history teacher. Uh, This is a great example of the moral dilemma that can occur in human history, and of course mean discoveries that were made on the back of the Holocaust. Um, So no beating around the bush. Oh, yeah. Um, So quick scene setting. The Holocaust, of course, the murder of 17 million people in Europe by the Nazis, one of humanity's greatest crimes, and one that targeted a number of groups considered undesirable or subhuman, primarily, of course, the Jewish community, homosexuals, gypsies, Soviet POWs and civilians, and Polish prisoners, amongst, of course, many other groups. Um, If you harbour even the glimmer of a view the Nazis held, turn off now, you aren't welcome. But out of evil came some science, and here is one of the great 20th century dilemmas. If you've ever seen someone rescued from the sea, you'll notice they are pulled out in a more horizontal fashion. Picture the search and rescue helicopter and the poor sod being winched up. Well, the Luftwaffe noticed that pilots were dying as they were being pulled from the sea, uh, and they wanted to know why. So cue lots of Holocaust victims, plunged into ice water, and, and pulled out. Yeah, um, lots died. Um, these were known as the Dachau hypothermia experiments and they were a travesty of human decency frankly Uh, but one result was the knowledge that pulling someone out of the sea vertically so imagine straight up uh, was likely to kill them due to stress Uh, the debate raged and is raging to this day about the efficacy the reliability and the moral position that this data and the data of these all these experiments not just the search and rescue stuff um, holds but ultimately in search and rescue the knowledge has been used and the techniques pioneered by these experiments are in use now so enjoy well yeah Uh, So for mine, I'm going to go with the debate over fission and fusion power um, and was it worth the bomb? Um, We know that Mm. um, during World War II um, that there was a race on to develop the atomic bomb and there's a fantastic book by um, Jim Baggett, which I think is called Atomic, um, which is a fantastic story of uh, of the the race to create the bomb all the way through from Rutherford up to trying to develop um, fission power. Uh, fusion power rather and basically this came about because there was a lot of German scientists that were instrumental in the physics that that led up to um, being able to develop the bomb and there was a fear particularly uh, with Einstein that um, if the Nazis developed the bomb then the war was over in favour of the Germans so he petitioned Franklin Delano Roosevelt to develop the atomic bomb uh, fearing that the uh, Germans were very far ahead in this. And actually, we, we found out afterwards that the, the Germans weren't very advanced. They put a lot of their research into rocketry um, that had such a devastating effect, particularly over London. Um, and um, they weren't likely to have actually developed the bomb, no matter how long they um, uh, the war went on for. And so it meant that there was um, a race on, or, or rather a one-sided race on to develop the bomb as fast as possible to use it and of course it has only been used twice um, it's been um, used over Japan um, so people have died uh, developing the bomb but it, what it does mean is that we do now have nuclear reactors to be able to j- develop power that doesn't harm the environment to the same way that fossil fuels do however it is quite unclean as well it leaves radioactive waste that um, um, that has a half-life into the uh, thousands of years and and you know with things like Chernobyl and is it three mile island five mile island seven mile island I forget um, that you know you, you do have these catastrophic failures that, that cause a lot of problems uh, of course the big dream is to have fusion power where rather than splitting atoms you're fusing atoms together that provides a lot cleaner energy and um, bigger bang for your book but also you don't have the same amount of radioactive waste and with efforts going on in places like jet in oxford 
Nature in England and ITER in France and the National Ignition Facility in the United States at Lawrence Livermore. I believe it's Lawrence Livermore. There, we're getting a lot closer to that break even of um, fusion power, um, and it's predicted that rather than it being 30 years away, that it's you know probably only about 10 years away from being able to develop the first functional fusion power reactors. Um, is it worth it? Don't know. With the advances of um, things like solar power and wind farms and tidal power generation, they've, they've come on in leaps and bounds in the last 20 years, and they might actually outstrip and make it much more cost-effective than nuclear power. But certainly the effort to defeat the Nazis using the bomb wasn't really that necessary and you can debate whether it shortened it saved more lives by being deployed over japan whether that was worth the cost but i would say you know that's one of those uh, areas where um you've got that kind of ambiguity as what was the science mm. and what came out of it worth what we created and then of course you've got hubble um, who used to put his cigarettes out on the hands of his assistants? He did um, not. He, yeah, and apparently, as they the, the scream as they ran out of the observatory is what gave him the idea of the sort of using red shift and blue shift. He was hearing the uh, shut the, up. No. Yeah, that's. Bo- I'm just making that up. <laughs> oh, for God's sake! <laughs> but I thought I'd like the mood I'm after the Holocaust like, and I nuclear warfare. <laughs> Like, I was literally, like, holding my breath. Oh, you're such a knob. (laughs) (laughs) I had to lighten the mood after the Holocaust and nuclear warfare. Christ. (laughs) Yeah, we went to a dark place there. Well, luckily for you, that's us just about done. Out of news, out of content, out of enthusiasm. It's been fun. More for us than for you, of course, but it's now time to go back in the box and recharge the batteries, ready for another invasion in a fortnight's time. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. Not that we'll listen to anything that you say that you don't like, because we do what we want anyway. It's our show. (laughs) You get it for free. Like it or lump it. An astro camp is almost upon us. The pitches have almost all gone. We have great skies, great torques, good beer, and John in a leather posing pouch every hour on the hour. <laughs> what are you waiting for? 25th to 28th of April. www.astrocamp.awesomeastronomy.com mm. So, until the 1st of April, it's goodbye from Sidonia Base. Bye! Bye! Awesome Astronomy is produced at Orbital Sound Limited by Ralph, Paul, Jenny, John and Damien and is free to use and distribute with attribution. We promote general science, astronomy, space science and rational thinking with more resources on our website at awesomeastronomy.com. If you want us to read your comments out on the show, send us your views, opinions, questions or critiques to the show at awesomeastronomy.com. Tweet us at awesomeastropod or give the Awesome Astronomy Facebook page a like and leave your comments there. Thanks for listening, and from Sidonia Base, end of transmission. <laughs>